Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Gyawali from Queen's University, Kingston, Canada. And today it's my big pleasure and honor to be speaking about assessing the value of new cancer drugs at the Evidence-Based Management Conference in India. I have no conflicts to disclose. So first let's discuss what value means. So value, as we understand, is the ratio of benefits to cost. So usually in health economics, we describe it in terms of cost effectiveness ratio of the new drugs. So which is difference in efficacy divided by difference in cost. So what this tells us is value does not necessarily mean clinical benefit, although clinical benefit is one part of the equation. It also depends on cost. So a drug can have substantial benefits and it still have poor value if it costs a lot. Whereas on the other hand, uh, a drug can have negligible benefits, but if it costs very cheap, then it can still have good value. So the question is, how can we improve value? As we have seen, value is benefits by cost. So there are two components to this equation, the denominator of cost and the numerator of clinical benefit. And in case of denominator, how to reduce the cost in order to improve value, that will be an entire uh, series uh, on its own. There are different strategies about that. How can we lower the cost of cancer drugs? Should we be using more generics and biosimilars and are they actually meaningful in lowering the cost of cancer treatment? Uh, should we focus more on repurposable drugs like dexamethasone in COVID-19? If we can find similarly repurposable drugs for cancer, then we'll have cheaper alternatives. Should we focus more on price negotiations and, and how countries or, or legislatures should, should handle this? And, and, and an important part of this discussion is that the price of cancer drugs is not related to the R&D cost that has been established by multiple studies. So this is a huge discussion in itself. And I have also written a book chapter about this. But today on this talk, I'd like to focus more on the numerator part of this equation, which is measuring clinical benefit and improving clinical benefits for that the value can be improved but measuring clinical benefit is quite tricky we need to, whether should we look at the median survival gains hazard ratios toxicity um, and in fact organizations like asco and ccn and esmo they have come up with the value tool or more accurately a clinical benefit assessment tool to help in guiding these decisions but what about bias inherent in the trials let's discuss about those issues even if it's a randomized controlled trial a high quality trial properly conducted there can be several issues in the trial design and trial analysis that can skew the results of the trial and make the drug look better than it actually is so these are the list of some of the issues that can skew the results of the clinical trials which i intend to discuss today so let's talk about early stopping of trials, which we have started to see more and more frequently in, in recent years, that the trials are stopped early due to impressive benefits that have crossed the uh, stopping boundary. But we know from several exercises that the sooner the trial is stopped, the more is the potential overestimation of treatment effects. So as seen in this graph, uh, the sooner the trial is stopped, the more impressive hazard ratio looks. So the real hazard ratio may be much less impressive than what we see in these trials uh, that have been stopped early. And this is especially problematic when the trial is stopped on the basis of subjective endpoints like progression-free survival, uh, which, is more which has more potential for bias. The other issue is that of crossover. And there are two types of issues here. One is crossover that should not have happened but happens. And the other is crossover that should have happened but does not happen. Uh, for example, we knew before that Evratron was an effective drug and was approved for based on survival gains for castration resistant prostate cancer. This trial tested Evratron at an earlier line of uh, therapy uh, during castration sensitive prostate cancer. And this compared Evratron versus placebo. So in this case, if the patient progresses, becomes castration resistant, then the patient should get Evratron, which is already the standard of care in that setting. So there should be crossover. But we can see that from the table that only 11% of the patients in the placebo group, they received Evratron after progression. So this is a trial design where crossover should have been inbuilt, but only 11% of the placebo arm patients got Evratron 
uh, upon disease progression and this could easily confound the results and show Everatron as much more effective than it actually is. On the other hand, for Cipollicil T, which is again a treatment for prostate cancer, now this is a treatment that had never been approved before. So this was its first trial and in this case, the control arm patients, after they progressed, they were crossover to receive the same unproven vaccine. These are the patients who would have received docetaxel after progression in usual practice. So the, the efficacy of Cipollicil T we see here could simply be an effect of the placebo arm patients not getting docetaxel and rather spending time being crossover to this treatment that had never been proven before. And this is also supported by the argument because we see here a survival gain for the drug, but time to tumor progression is not different and there is just one objective response. The other is the issue of substandard control arm. And in fact, uh, there was a paper published last year which shows that the issue of using substandard control arm and the crossover issues that we discussed earlier are quite common among clinical trials that have led to EFT approval. 25% of them had substandard control arm and 14% of them had errors in crossover. And when we are talking about substandard control arm, this can be of two times. One is using a control treatment that is already known to be inferior to another treatment and the other is using a placebo when active treatment uh, options are available. Um, I'll give you one example of each. The SN4 trial of first-line serotonin versus platinum-based chemo, this ran from 2013 to 2015. But we already knew that crizotinib was superior to chemotherapy in the exact same setting uh, and it had received accelerated approval on 2011 and full approval in 2013. So these are the patients who would have received crizotinib if they were not a part of the trial. And the other example is that of maintenance olaparib from the Polo trial of uh, pancreatic cancer. In this trial, patients with metastatic pancreatic cancer who were, who were receiving polyphenox, after 16 weeks of therapy, they got randomized to receive olaparib or placebo. So in real practice, these patients continue to receive some form of treatment, uh, some form of chemotherapy. But stopping treatment for patients on metastatic pancreatic cancer after 16 weeks um, and randomizing them to placebo is not the standard of care. And in fact, this trial gives some good examples of the problems with uh, uh, assessing clinical trial data critically in, in the modern era because when these results were published, some experts said Olaparib should become a standard of care. It is truly remarkable finding and it's really exciting data. But to be honest, irrespective of that problem with using a placebo control, if we look at the data, there is some significant benefit in PFS, but overall survival remains the same. There is absolutely no difference in overall survival. What about quality of life? Quality of life was reported as maintained, which is a fancy way of saying quality of life was not improved. So basically, we are talking about a drug that does not improve quality of life or survival, but costs nearly $12,000 a month and has some side effects. So this is not the drug that we would call as truly remarkable. The other issue is that of surrogate endpoints. Uh, various regulatory agencies approve various cancer drugs based on trials that have demonstrated improvement not in overall survival or quality of life, but on surrogate endpoints. So in this research, we looked at all the surrogate endpoints for breast cancer, and we looked at whether or not they had a strong correlation with overall survival. And we found that pathological complete response, response rate and progression-free survival were poorly correlated with overall survival. And disease-free survival also had a poor correlation in general, but had a strong correlation for HAR2 positive tumor types. And event-free survival had never been studied as a, as a surrogate endpoint. But in, in practice, we usually think of surrogate endpoint as clinical benefit in itself, which is not. And data like this show that they have very poor correlation with overall survival, if any. So we need to evaluate trials based on the strength of correlation of each surrogate endpoint with overall survival or quality of life. 
And I'd like to highlight this recent trial, ADORA trial of lung cancer, because it highlights several issues that we are talking today. In ADORA trial, patients with stage 1b to 3 non-responsive lung cancer, EGFR mutation positive, after they received surgery and adjuvant chemotherapy, they were randomized to receive adjuvant osimertinib or placebo for three years. And there was disease-free survival benefit, and this has been approved by the FDA now, and there was a lot of fanfare about this uh, trial. But this trial highlights several key problems which were highlighted in this paper. One is that several patients in the control group, they did not receive adjuvant chemotherapy, which is the standard of care. They did not, uh, and several patients in this trial, they have not received MRI scan of the brain to screen for brain metastasis, which is again deviation from standard of care. And the benefit in this trial we see is only in terms of disease-free survival, which is just a sort of an endpoint and not overall survival. And this trial was dominated early based on that disease-free survival benefit. So a lot of the points that we're discussing today is highlighted by this trial. The other issue we need to keep in mind is about non inferior design. We see a more and more number of non inferior design trials in oncology, but are non inferiority design trials justified in that particular setting is the first question we need to ask. non inferiority design is justified only if the new agent is cheaper, which never happens in oncology, or provides some quality of life benefit, uh, or has some ease of administration, like the standard of care is IV, but the newer drug is overall. The standard of care is every week, but the newer drug is every three weeks, and so on. But we found that in recent oncology RCTs, in 40% of the cases, the non inferior design was not justified. One problem. And the other problem is how do we define non inferior We found that non inferior definitions ranged up to 1.33. That means up to 33% increase uh, in the hazard of death was considered acceptable or non inferior. But who is to decide that? And the other issue that has come out recently is violation of the statistical plan of the same trial. So when a trial is planned, there is a statistical analysis uh, plan with the trial, but the trial analysis violating its own plan uh, and coming out with false positive signal. So this is the impassion 130 trial of atezolizumab plus nap paclitaxel in advanced triple negative breast cancer. And as you can see highlighted here, the two primary endpoints were PFS and OS. And this OS would first be tested in intention to treat population. And if that was significant, then only it would be tested in the PDL1 positive subgroup. This is the plan. So these are the results. There is some benefit in terms of PFS. Uh, which looks more impressive for the PDL1 positive group. But in terms of OS, there is absolutely no difference in the intention to treat population. And the plan, the statistical plan, was to not do an analysis in the PDL1 positive subgroup if in the overall population OS was not significant. However, in violation of their own plan, they did perform a subgroup analysis of the PDL1 population and found that there was a substantial benefit in median overall survival, nearly 10 months of benefit, 15.5 versus 25 months, which looks very impressive. But the fact is that this analysis was not part of the statistical plan and violates the statistical analysis uh, protocol that it would be conducted only if the intention to treat was positive. However, this led to its accelerated approval from the US FDA because uh, they looked at the substantial amount of uh, improvement in survival. Later at ESMO 2020, in Passion 131, a confirmatory trial results were published. And this shows that in this confirmatory trial, actually atezolizumab plus paclitaxel did not improve even PFS in the ITD population, in the PDL1 population. And overall survival actually has a hazard ratio of more than one so there is a signal of harm instead and people found this very surprising why this trial results differ from impasse 130 uh, the previous trial but actually the previous trial results should have been taken with a grain of salt to begin with because those analysis violated the trial's own plan and the final issue is about publication bias this shows that 
there is publication bias in, in publishing quality of life data from cancer drug trials and especially if the trial is negative then there is a significant delay in publication of the quality of life results and pub quality of life is an important component of uh, trial evaluation in order to make a judgment about clinical benefit of the cancer drug so in conclusion value depends on both costs and benefits and cost control is complex and is a medical socio-political issue however assessment of clinical benefit must be accurate it's, it should be an objective marker. So all clinicians, regulators, policymakers, and stakeholders must be aware of these issues with clinical trial design, analysis, and implementation that we discussed today that can falsely show that a cancer drug is better than it actually is. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions by email or otherwise.